This is the University of Bristol hosted Alan Turing Institute Fellowship Projects Seminars. This is the last of five great days we've had this week, um, showcasing the work of, of uh, the Turing Fellows across the country in topic themes. And we're delighted today to welcome um, professors uh, Paul Wilcox and Nick Wright um, to talk about the work they've been doing under the um, data centric engineering theme. My name is Professor Kate Robson Brown. I'm director of the Gene Golding Institute, which is the University of Bristol's Institute for Data Science. Um, and we act as the, the portal, for, portal for, the, for engagement between the University of Bristol and the Turing. Um, just a few housekeeping items. We are going to record this um, session, so you might want to turn off the video stream of your cameras. Um, that might be a good idea. Um, and we're going to use Slido today for questions. So Lily's going to put um, a link in the chat now. So please, if you have questions for our speakers, could you um, uh, write them in there? And then when we come to the end of each session, so each speaker has half an hour, um, we're going to leave five or 10 minutes at the end of, of each session for questions. And then I will um, chair that session and read out, read out your questions and we hope to get some dialogue going. Um, so just as a little bit of background before we get started, um, these projects have been supported by the Alan Turing Institute over the last couple of years um, as part of a call that was made for to university partners in 2018. Um, and these presentations themselves form part of a much wider portfolio of um, online talks, uh, which is hosted by the Alan Turing Institute. So Lily's also going to put um, a link in the chat to those events. And please do sign up for any other activities that um, you might be interested in joining. Workshops, data study groups, talks, presentations, all those kinds of things are hosted by, by the Turing throughout the year. So let's get started. And our first speaker is um, Professor Paul Wilcox representing his team. Um, and the talk is Applying Data Science to Automate Interpretation of Non-Destructive Evaluation Data. Over to you, Paul. Thanks, Kate. Um, morning, all. So, um, yep, I'm Paul Wilcox from the University of Bristol from the Ultrasonics and Non-Destructive Testing Group, uh, which is part of the UK Research Centre and NDE, which is a industry academia collaboration uh, with six universities and about 14 um, end user companies. Uh, quite a few people have contributed to this work. As I go through, I'll try and explain who, um, who did which bits. But moving swiftly on, this is what's coming. Um, I thought I'd talk briefly a bit about what uh, non-destructive evaluation or NDE is, uh, the context and motivation for the work, the kind of overarching challenges for applying machine learning to NDE data and somewhere between one and three examples, depending on how fast I get through the other stuff. And finally, a few words about um, what I've been doing with the Turing Institute and uh, to promote the work outside. So NDE is basically about assessing the integrity of engineering structures without damaging them. Um, that NDE with capital letters, rather than just the uh, literal meaning of non-destructive evaluation, specifically refers to uh, techniques for assessing the um, mechanical strength and integrity of structures. So um, although, um, for instance, dimensional metrology is a non-destructive measurement, it wouldn't really be classed as NDE in the, in the normal sense of the word. Uh, so a couple of examples of um, industrial NDE on this picture. This is um, ultrasonic. Um, inspection of some aircraft component. This is a X-ray CT um, cell. The order of magnitude of sizes from individual uh, data from individual measurements is indicated here in the typically in the tens of megabytes, the tens of gigabytes. And the, 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 the consequences of inadequate NDE um, are usually quite spectacular. That's about the only time it gets in the news. And of course, the the, the financial loss can be enormous. The, the cost of um, the Haysham and Hartlepool power stations being shut down for six months is in, in, um, in the hundreds of millions of pounds. That was because, well, that was actually because of NDE finding some critical cracks. So although they were shut down um, the, and there was a significant loss of revenue, at least they managed to reopen again. Uh, this was a recent um, uh, fan blade out incident, I think somewhere in the States, again, led to planes being grounded. Uh, so really, finding defects before they cause catastrophic failures is, is what it's all about. And the thing about 
modern NDE is the, the amount of data that's generated is just going up and up and up. So from a very high resolution 3D X-ray CT images of engineering components, uh, ultrasonic array imaging, which is, is the area that I work on particularly, um, where this, this is an example of a weld being inspected with an ultrasonic array that uh, traverses along next to it at each position, which might be done every millimetre along the weld. Um, a set of images is, uh, is obtained, uh, so there's an enormous amount of data to process. Likewise, there's more and more permanently installed sensors now, which are uh, connected to, uh, to the internet, so they're making measurements um, maybe hourly. So again, a huge uh, flow of data coming in from all sorts of different um, sources. And really moving forward, um, it's the data is only going to get more and the amount of automation required is going to go up and up and up. So this was a, um, a rather idealistic vision I put together for some, um, uh, some proposal, but it really shows how we see NDE in the future relating to a digital twin. And the key words in here are uh, the volume of data coming in, the fact that all the analysis of it has to be um, increasingly automated. At the moment, there's an awful lot of human intervention involved in analysing NDE data. And the idea is ultimately to have a seamless flow of data into a digital twin of an asset where it's combined with um, continuously updating structural integrity models so that the whole thing becomes a fully automa automated, non-destructive verification process that can be accessed in real time. But that's some way off. So from an NDE point of view, there's kind of two drivers for um, applying data science. One is simply as a means of getting through more data. Um, so taking out the human element in data interpretation, which has the advantage that you remove the effect of human factors, it enables you to deal with higher volumes of data. And this is all feeding into the future industry for vision. On the other hand, maybe more exciting is doing using machine learning to do interpretation that's currently beyond human cognitive ability or beyond what can be written down in a simple um, protocol for somebody to follow. Typically, um, multi-step analysis or analyzing data with more than uh, two dimensions, which is obviously um, quite difficult for a human operator, or combining information from multiple different measurement modalities, possibly with different sense, or almost certainly with different sensitivities, different um, spatial resolutions, different temporal resolutions. So that on the left hand side, the motivation is really increasing reliability and reducing cost. On the right hand side, it's increasing what can actually be done. So <clears throat> the challenges are NDE is mostly applied to high value safety critical components. And because such things are usually pretty well made, genuine defects are fortunately rare. Um, which means, uh, which is a good thing, obviously, in the in the grand scheme of things, but it's not so good from the point of view of uh, getting data for machine learning. And even making samples with um, artificial defects, especially for their high value components, is obviously expensive and obtaining re realistic artificial defects is, is an art form in itself and, of course, very expensive. So we have a, a, a big challenge if we're going to apply machine learning, which is to deal with the lack of um, true positive, as in uh, data that does contain um, information about defects. The other problem is that because NDE is almost always applied to um, safety critical systems, is that in most cases it's highly regulated. So um, generally to be, have very high um, performance and that needs to be kind of provable. Uh, so various metrics such as the probability of detection need to be provably very high and as high or higher than they currently are. And current qualification procedures for new inspections are not based on the uh, data-driven approaches, they're based on physical reasoning. So the current inspection qualification procedures are not themselves suitable for um, machine learning based um, approaches to analyzing data. So there's another challenge, which is how to qualify such inspections in the future. So um, our first example um, is, I guess, a conceptually fairly straightforward one. It's characterizing defects from images. This work was done primarily by Richard Pyle, who is an NGD student um, supported by Baker Hughes in our, uh, in our group. And the, this, is the, this is the context. So um, Baker Hughes, amongst other things, um, provide inspection services for 
um, oil and gas pipelines. So um, here's one, there's some beautiful scenery around it. But these things run for hundreds or thousands of kilometres through some fairly inhospitable terrain. And one of the ways they're inspected is by passing a device through it called a PIG, which allegedly stands for Pipeline Inspection Gauge. Um, also rumoured to be called that because of the squealing noise they make when they're, they're passing through the pipe. So these are inserted into the pipe at some point. Uh, they go along in the flow of the product in the pipe and will be picked up maybe hundreds of kilometres later. So they're logging data as they go. This particular one is an ultrasonic pig. Um, so it's got multiple ultrasonic sensors. And the idea is to map the thickness of the pipe wall every um, everywhere throughout the, throughout the length of the pipe and to detect things like cracks and corrosion in it. Um, there's an end on view. So the challenge here is the motivation here is really just how do you deal with the enormous volume of data from um, such a, a, a device? And the, the particular challenge is, if I just advance this slightly, um, this is looking end on at the pig on the left hand side and around the edge are multiple ultrasonic array transducers uh, that effectively um, probe each region on the, the of the pipe wall from two different places, once uh, from the left hand side uh, and once from the right hand side. So the same region is seen twice, once from over here, once from over here, and from each position it's seen in two slightly different ways depending on which ultrasonic wave modes you use. So the net result is you end up for every single position on the pipe wall uh, on the circumference, um, you end up with four um, different images of the same region and the challenge is that the information about any defects present is spread across the four of those which may or may not be exactly co-registered with each other. So it's sort of classic machine learning uh, problem. I should emphasize that we're not starting with the completely raw data here, we're making use of some uh, prior uh, knowledge of the physics. The actual raw data is a series of time domain signals that's recorded from each individual element in the ultrasonic arrays around the, the pig, but those are first converted through a signal processing algorithm to these images. So at that stage, we've already exploited some physics knowledge about how waves refract and propagate. Um, so th th there is some physics already in the loop, but we're applying the, the machine learning to the outcome of this imaging process. And uh, as ever, the, the shortage of real true positive data, um, there isn't enough of it. So we have a, a fairly good model here, and this gives you an idea of the number of data sets we've, have, we've used for training. So it's a, in uh, tens of thousands. And the key is that the model has to be pretty uh, good and close to experiments. The top row is simulated data from the model. The bottom row is experimental data. And you can kind of see the challenge here because the black line indicates the position of a crack, uh, and these are the images from it. So in some cases, um, maybe this one, the, the the indication is quite well aligned to the crack, but there's a huge artifact over here. In other images, you can see the bottom of the crack and maybe the tip, and the other ones you can't see it at all. So the question is, can you reliably extract the information for lots of different lengths and orientations of crack from, um, from the multiple images? And we've got a limited amount of experimental data uh, for validation. So the, the actual, the machine learning is, I guess, a fairly routine um, convolutional neural network architecture. The input is a four layer image where the four layers correspond to these different views. So it's rather like a, um, an RGB image, except that they're not colors anymore. They're different um, look angles, if you like. And the final output uh, is the a prediction of the length of the crack. So this is applied once something has been detected. It's not a detection algorithm, it's a characterization algorithm. And there's a second uh, almost identical network that predicts the angle of any cracks that are present. Um, training is, uh, I guess, a fairly standard method. We train on the simulated data, but we test on um, the uh, and, uh, and validate the model on a subset of the experimental data. And the, the model we choose is the one that gives the best performance on uh, the subset of experimental data. And then we do the final test on previously unseen, uh, sorry, on experimental data and we do the final test on previously unseen experimental data. And this is kind of how the results look. And I guess the one point I'm making here is that we, we have to compare whatever we get out of a machine learning algorithm with what's the current best practice. So in these graphs, the blue histogram represents the current best practice, which is a, 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 
interpretation of a single image, essentially just drawing a contour around the biggest indication and measuring the size of that. And these are graphs of error in length and angle. And so the spread of the blue um, is reasonably significant. It's roughly a 1.1 millimeter root mean square error. The uh, ignore the green histogram for a moment. The orange one is the one to focus on here, which is the results of the, um, the, the convolutional neural network. And you can see the spread of that is roughly um, three times smaller RMS error than the conventional method. So that's good. We can also add a bit of uncertainty, which makes it uh, much more like the reality because this uh, the pig devices uh, tends to be bobbling around all over the place as it moves. So the exact position um, relative to the the pipe is is not known. There might be uncertainty in the uh, in the velocity of the uh, product in the pipe and in the uh, the velocity of sound in the steel wall, both of which affect the ultrasonic imaging. And the the, the take home message here is that we can put that variability into the training data and train with data with variability, which ultimately leads to an algorithm that's um, that's much more robust. So it's not quite as good performance if we control everything, but it still does significantly better than the classic method. So again, a factor of about three improvement. Right, the, the second example, uh, possibly the second and third example relate to um, the detection problem. So that previous uh, example was a, a, a characterization problem once we found a defect, but this is about how you find the defects in the first place. And what I'm looking at here is suppressing artifacts. So just maybe to take a step back, I mean, one approach to applying machine learning to NDE data would be to first of all, throw away all the physics knowledge that we've acquired over the last uh, 50, 60, 70 years, and instead, just throw a huge amount of data at a great big box, black box of machine learning and try and predict everything in one pass, which is obviously not particularly efficient and it kind of throws away a huge amount of uh, prior knowledge. So the question is, and I think this is key to successful application of machine learning in NDE and no doubt many other areas is to, how, is to try and make as much use of knowledge of the problem and uh, physics as possible. in particular to try and break down the challenge into separate parts, um, use the physics, and then just apply machine learning at the steps where it's actually needed. So if you look at the detection problem, this is a sort of simple diagram of what happens in almost any measurement. We, we have a measurement that comes in, and what we're looking for is to distinguish indications from potential defects, which can then be characterized from the other stuff, which is typically made up of a combination of some sort of stochastic noise, which might be backscatter from material microstructure. It could be random electronic noise, Oh, and it could be some discrete artifacts. And actually, um, we can deal with the stochastic noise fairly easily with um, standard statistical methods. But the big challenge is the distinguishing between defect indications and artifacts, um, whether it's in a x-ray X-ray image where that's the defect, but you might have some sort of structural feature nearby. How do you t tell which one's which? These are ultrasonic array images, and you can see there's some bright stripes in them. But in fact, in this case, these are all artifacts and structural reflections, not defects. So <clears throat> the basic workflow is that we try and train machine learning to stress artifacts in some way. Um, the advantage of looking to to suppress artifacts rather than looking to um, characterize defects directly with machine learning is that it means we don't need to have defect responses for the training. We only need defect free data and we can use that to learn what the variability in the experimental setup is and where the artifacts are going to appear. And it also means, as I've shown a second, that we can leverage established methods for def detection and characterization once we've got rid of the artifacts, which overall is attractive to a fairly risk averse community in that it gives a better understanding of how the whole process is going to work rather than just throwing machine learning at everything. So the general uh, workflow is that we do the training on defect free um, data, which is generally speaking fairly readily available, uh, whether through simulation or through actual measurements, because there's not generally a problem of finding components that don't have defects in them. We train some sort of machine learning algorithm to learn where the artifacts are in that defect free data. And then when we're in operation, we apply the same process, but of course now we don't know if the measurement contains a defect or not. So 
having worked out what the artifacts are, we apply some sort of artifact suppression to the measurement data, which could be ideally subtracting out the artifacts, but it could be just masking them. And then we look at what's left over and try and determine if there's um, a defect in that, which should now be a, just a case of distinguishing defect signals from uh, stochastic noise. And that means we can apply standard detection and characterization methods. So the second example, which is an application of this, was done by Sergio Canteret in Chile, who is the PDRA that's actually funded off my Turing um, pilot project. Um, this is a typical ultrasonic array image uh, from a defect fee sample. Um, uh, so there's a load of stochastic noise here, which is the uh, backscatter from material microstructure, but all these other indications are artifacts from one thing or another, whether from the imaging algorithm or from structural features. This is probably from the back wall. Um, this is probably a mode conversion from the back wall. So the current solution, um, which is pretty brutal, is simply to mask out any regions that have an artifact in them, which obviously massively reduces the amount of material we can inspect from one particular position. Um, so what we're looking for is a, is a more elegant way of doing that, which is to learn where the artifacts are in the raw data before we convert it to images. Uh, and as you'll see in a second, that um, massively expands uh, the, the amount of material we can inspect from one position. Uh, so this this is the configuration. Um, it's a, a slightly contrived one, but it's a fairly typical one for ultrasonic inspection where we have a probe uh, coupled to a sample um, via water. This is the sample which represents what well, it could be the, a pipe wall, a pressure vessel wall or something like that. And there's uncertainty in maybe the thickness of the sample, the standoff for the probe and the angle of the probe uh, as indicated in this animation. So we assume that the Defect free data will be governed by, in this case, three parameters, but I mean, it could be more. Uh, this is just to demonstrate the principle where these three parameters are the three ones indicated here. So what we have to do is to train on defect free data to learn what these parameters are and then predict where the artifacts from the structural reflections are going to arrive in the raw data. Um, I won't go through the too much detail about how we train the autoencoder um, but it said move on to how it works in practice. So we put in some measured raw data. The autoencoder looks at that. It deduces the experimental parameters, so the probe position, the specimen thickness, and the probe angle from that data, it deduces where the artifacts are likely to be in the raw data, which means that we can then mask out the artifacts in the raw data. So this is before we get to the imaging stage and then form images based on raw data, but with the artifacts removed from it. And as a bonus, because we're extracting these parameters, the, the latent parameters uh, related to the physical measurement setup, they actually turn out to be also ones we need for the formation of images. So we kind of get a, a, a double win here. Again, um, just an example that, that so, uh, well, almost 5,000 data sets used for training, they came from um, a, a numerical forward model. This is an example of applying that model trained on simulated data to raw experimental data. So this is a, a subset of the raw data acquired from an array measurement. So up this axis is the element number in the array. This axis is ultrasonic time. And basically the, the brightly colored signals are artifacts from structural features. So this is the front surface of the sample. This is probably the back surface. These are multiple reverberations. So all of these are gonna be present in every measurement and they're not the things that are interest. So they can be masked out. And what we're left with is the bits in between, which is either um, noise, uh, stochastic noise or defect signals. So there's a, a, an example experimental result of the resulting image, left-hand side, no artifact, uh, suppression. So in this case, in the normal circumstances, we'd have to just ignore the left-hand side and just focus on detecting things on the right. And this is with artifact suppression turned on. So the artifact suppression is done through the machine learning methodology. And now we can indeed inspect the left-hand side. And as it turns out, there is a defect here, which was a, a small saw cut in the, in the bottom of the specimen. These are just some pretty animation showing how it works. This is now on um, simulated data putting simulated data through it, but this is just showing as the probe traverses along the specimen, some variability in um, its standoff and its angle. This is the image result uh, when we don't do any artifact suppression. So you can see that there's a, a defect appears and it's visible over here, but then it disappears into the artifacts. 
whereas over here after we've done the artifact suppression it's visible pretty much all the way across um, I think as we're running out of time I'm going to skip over this second example which was another example of artifact suppression but applied to uh, permanent monitoring data so let me just up to the chase I knew I was never going to have time to get through this so I'll give you my reflection so far on applying machine learning for NDE. I should say I'm, I'm not from a machine learning background um, at all. I'm from a uh, definitely a physics-based data processing uh, background and uh, focused on the engineering application rather than the machine learning uh, as an end in itself. But I think one obvious point is that choosing the right problem uh, to attack is critical and noting that actually a lot of the automation challenges for NDE going forward can actually be solved um, by the application, uh, correct application of standard signal processing and statistical techniques, the machine learning is an unnecessary complication in a lot of cases. As far as possible, we should exploit um, known physics, which reduces the burden on what the machine learning has to do. Um, obviously, I, the naive approach is to just feed everything into a machine learning algorithm, but then you're actually relying on the machine learning deducing um, the laws of say refract refraction and propagation for sound waves. Um, so why why would you want to do that? You should try and include that before you get to the machine learning stage. And the other advantage of doing that is that it increases the ultimate explainability of the output. The shortage of um, true positive data is is a major challenge, uh, and I guess the kind of the the obvious way solution to that is to have a great uh, forward model. Um, physics-based forward model to generate simulated data. And the closer that is to replicating what you see experimentally and with all the subtleties of um, experimental uncertainty, uh, the better. So these are just some examples on the left-hand side are model results, the right-hand side are equivalent experimental results. Um, and this, well, this is pretty good. I think uh, it's almost indistinguishable from the, the between the model and the experiment. And, I didn't, there was an example that I skipped, but the use of appropriate performance metrics is essential and absolutely to do a quantitative comparison between the machine learning results and the best current method. If these things are gonna have any traction, that's gotta be demonstrated. Uh, so just finally, um, I say a few things that I've been doing with the Turing Institute and beyond. We kicked off with a data science for NDE day in Bristol way back in 2019, which had about 60 or 70 people there. I think that was actually the last in-person event I went to. Um, rather sad. Uh, there's been a GW4 data centric engineering workshop online uh, just before uh, Christmas last year, which I was involved in. I've since then, I formed the uh, Data Science for Engineering Structure Integrity Interest Group uh, at the Alan Turing Institute. So that's had um, two events so far, an online launch event, an event dedicated to nuclear structure integrity and data automation. And coming up, uh, it's just been postponed till May 2020, uh, yeah, May 2022, there'll be a workshop on the um, a requirements gathering workshop for industry for looking at structured integrity, NDT and condition monitoring. That's hopefully going to be at the MTC in Coventry. And I've done a few invited talks and there's a couple coming up at conferences that may or may not take place next year. Uh, right, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Fantastic to hear about to hear about the work and all the other ways in which you've been engaged. And we don't have any questions yet. I don't know. This is a bit of a call out to the audience if you want to ask one. Um, That's but a bonus. I'm interested. If, so, right at the beginning of your talk, you presented your kind of data architecture with your digital twin in the middle and your inputs and outputs. Um, and you said you're not there yet. What is the what is the main challenge to achieving that? Do you think? And and I suppose there's a second question there, which is what is the appetite of um, of this kind of approach to be adopted in industrial settings? Right, I'll answer the second question first. I think top down, there's a very strong appetite, uh, if not an actual assumption that it's just going to happen, um, that everything will have a digital twin and you'll be able to get an iPad out and look at some beautiful 3D rendering and see a, a sort of red splodge appearing saying this is, bit's going to fail in five years. But the reality on the ground, I think, is quite a long way off that. Um, 
what one problem is there's quite a big divide at the moment between the structural integrity community and the NDE community. We tend to, uh, we being the NDE community, tend to stop our bit um, with some inspection report that says probably handwritten um, either there's no defects in this or there's a two millimetre long crack here and then that information gets passed manually to the structural integrity community so that the, the whole workflow between the two has to be kind of automated. And I think that might be one of the biggest challenges. Um, and in general, on the NDE side, it's definitely um, automation, both of the data gathering and the conversion of data into meaningful information. Thank you. Just a couple of really quick ones, I think, coming in, and then we'll, we'll move on to Nick. Um, how long does the training process work? How long does it take? Um, in, in in machine learning terms, I, I think uh, hours to days rather than um, weeks. I, I don't think it's that's the at the moment the rate determining step. I mean, the generating simulated data to drive the training is probably a, a significantly bigger burden. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. That'd be my expectation as well. Um, next question: How do you determine what algorithm to choose when you do machine learning? Ah, now that is a good question. Um, I saw sort of pluck one out of thin air usually, um, or I hope that somebody tells me this looks like a, um, a suitable one for this, but this is where trying to get people with general expertise from the Alan Turing Institute or elsewhere who have a good overview of um, different algorithms, their suitability would be really good. I think it's some, some some place some situations there's kind of a there's an obvious choice um so anything involving images would probably be some sort of convolutional neural network but there are other things where we're not really sure what's the best approach and we're, we're maybe fishing around a bit agreed and finally are regulators involved in these new developments that's interesting they, they are involved in the sense that they're keeping an eye on what's going on. So the Office of the Nuclear Regulator, for instance, is a, a fairly active RCNDE member and RCNDE kind of has a, uh, this this project is, is kind of, has been kind of integrated into RCNDE's core program. So they, they know what's going on. Um, they will tend to push it back to um, inspection companies to say, well, it's up to you to determine how you're going to prove it to us. Um, they, they don't necessarily say what's the, the methodology for qualification. They just say, you've got to make a convincing case. Yeah. I think um, I'm aware that there are a few more questions coming in, but maybe we could send them to you, Paul, separately by email. Um, yep. So sure. we'll move on. Thank you very much again, Paul. Little virtual round of applause. We can't do this. That's one of the worst things about these online talks, isn't it? You can't do that. You can't see the audience. Um, but we'll move on to our next talk, which is from Professor Nick Wright from Newcastle University, who's going to speak to us. Now, the title I have is Boosting Manufacturing Productivity Through AI. Through AI. But Nick. Amazingly, that is the talk. That is there the we go. title, I think. <laughs> Over to you. how long ago it was set up. Yeah. Um, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm going to just, sorry, I'll just try and see if I can get that onto presentation mode. Um, okay, so... Uh, so yes, yeah, so good morning. Uh, my name is Nick Wright from Newcastle University. Um, I, I'm from the School of Engineering uh, at Newcastle, but I'm collaborating with uh, people here in computer science. Um, we have a very able student working on this area, Matthew Kent Myers and uh, our academic colleague Steve McGough. So um, I'm going to talk about um, the use of artificial intelligence or machine learning or whatever you, you like to call it in manufacturing productivity. So my, my context is, is factories, really. Um, so this picture here um, is a, a picture of the Nissan car factory, which is very close to us here in Newcastle. It's a huge factory, employs about 6,000 people, um, which is a, you know, one of the largest factories in Britain. But I, I challenge anybody to see if you can find a person in this picture. Um, this is a picture of one of the main parts of the assembly line. And if people are not familiar with, with big factories, what happens in the factory is that everything, the car is made more or less from raw materials, from raw steel, uh, raw parts that are come in. It's just like a, a manufacturing assembly, uh, all the, essentially an assembly process of bringing together pre-made parts. Um, and 
this is actually one of the main sections of the thing where the, the cars are actually being physically constructed, welded together. And what you can see really is that it's highly automated. Um, it, this section is almost completely robotic um, and the robots are behind cages and they're behind cages actually because it's dangerous for the people. And that's why you can't see any, any of the 6,000 workers in this section of the factory. Um, and the context here really is that we're looking at tries to, ways to try and improve the efficiency of the plant because in other parts of the plant there are obviously workers so this is a section where workers are uh, assembling uh, parts into the underside of the car um, there's actually a picture of my cousin who works in the in the plant so um, he was kindly agreed to be photographed and what he's doing here is he's putting in some of the main components on into the underside of the car and he has about um, he has a, a set time period. Each car comes above, comes on a conveyor belt above him, and then the car will move on uh, and so on to the next station. So he has to complete his tasks, and he does the same tasks uh, more or less. So though he does rotate around the factory to do different things to stop uh, workers getting bored, but essentially on any given day he, he does a fairly repetitive uh, task. Each task is quite skilled, uh, but he repeats it many times as the cars pass above him. Uh, going through, down through the factory. And what, in terms of the, the reason why efficiency is important is, is it's partly about actually maintaining the capacity of, of, of the reason why companies would like to have factories within the UK. Because what you, if you look at the costs of a, of a factory, it's obviously a huge uh, cost, many billions of pounds. And the machinery costs pretty much the same wherever you build the factory in the world. The robots, the everything else, they all cost, they cost largely the same wherever you buy them. The differentiating factor really is the cost of the people. The, the wages we want to pay in this country are considerably higher than they might be in other countries. So if we're to retain manufacturing uh, in this country, we have to help these factories use people as, as efficiently as possible so that they can get the maximum productivity and retain these kind of well-paid jobs uh, in our local economies. Now, at the moment, what you see is the almost complete separation between robots and people. And what we're trying to explore, our motivation really, is to try and explore whether it's possible for the people and the robots to work together, because there's a belief that this will lead to more, uh, more efficient uh, production uh, and uh, safeguard jobs. So we're looking at that kind of uh, collaboration essentially between people and robots. Now, there is a terminology for this as well that is sometimes referred to as a cobot, that's a collaborating robot. And there are now a few manufacturers who are making and selling uh, uh, cobots on the, uh, the open market. They tend to be very simple at the moment. They're simply robots that can detect the presence of a person and uh, stop their motion or uh, adapt their motion to make ensure that they don't collide with the person. What we're trying to do is go way beyond that. We're trying to look at whether it's actually possible for robots and people to work together in a truly collaborative way. And the mental image that we tend to use is of an operating theater. If you see, in, if you look in, I've never actually been in an operating theater, I confess, but um, if you look on medical dramas, you see that you have multiple people bending over the same patient. They work together in an incredibly collaborative way. Um, it's almost unspoken. Um, they seem to uh, know intuitively what the other person is doing and they adapt their own uh, motions, their own uh, activities to suit what the other people are doing. And you have this incredible sort of assistance that's provided to the surgeons by the theatre nurses, for example, who seem to anticipate the needs of the surgeons before they actually even know themselves that they need the next uh, tool, for example. So the question is, can we develop systems where robots and humans might, in a more, perhaps in a more primitive way, work together in a truly collaborative uh, type of uh, approach? Now, if you think about that a bit, what you, you, you come to really is just some, some basic sort of thoughts about how could that possibly work? And the answers are things like this. So if a robot's going to help a worker, then it needs to have some sort of understanding about what the worker is doing. In an th operating theatre, everybody in that theatre knows, knows what's going on. They know what the operation is. They know the kind of tools that are going to be used. So there's a huge amount of understanding, a shared understanding between the people in the operating theatre. And of course, what's interesting as well is that actually when you look in those examples of an operating theatre to a non-expert, 
it's very hard to distinguish one action from another. Everything looks very similar. And that's what's true also in an industrial environment. People do very, uh, it's a relatively limited range of things that people do, but they are very, they need to be able to distinguish between very many similar actions if you're going to understand. So uh, any robotic or computer system has really got to recognize these actions first and then be able to then compute what help might be useful to the, to the person. So this, what I'm going to talk about today, focuses really on that first part, the action recognition. But we're talking about actions in, not in a lab or in an ideal setting, but we're talking about actions in a real world factory where we've got all the complexity uh, of that kind of situation. Now, just a few words uh, about the sort of, if you like, the science or the uh, uh, of action recognition. So what we're going to we end up doing when we want to recognize actions is that we need to, to it's essentially a video uh, data stream that we use um, because many actions are not distinguishable by still camera images. You can't really tell what the surgeon is doing from a single still image. You would have to watch a video to see what they actually do that they might be removing a kidney or working on a heart and you can only really tell that from a video not from a still image so what you get to with the action recognition is really using video film and uh, this this category of work's been going on for quite a long time now uh, one of my favorite i've featured here one of my own personal favorite papers which is a 2012 paper uh, and they looked in this uh, work at actually training um, convolutional neural networks to distinguish between actions and they used YouTube videos uh, that they downloaded and processed uh, and then they were able to build a system a convolutional neural network system that could actually distinguish between these actions but the actions were actually comparatively coarse-grained if you like they were you know we it was things like well in this example I've got here the difference between skydiving and playing cricket so relatively coarse distinctions. Uh, it's much harder, for example, to tell between different cricket shots. That would be what we would call a fine grained uh, uh, system. So in this, these early works were really uh, focused on these very coarse grained differences of actions. Uh, and often they had very different backgrounds as well. A, a, you know, a, a boat on a river has a very different background to a cricket, a person playing cricket. So the background information in the films is also actually used by the CNNs to actually make the to help with the distinguishing as well. So we're not going to have that in our fine grained environments. Um, we're going to be looking in a factory environment. It's going to be the same environment. Uh, and we're looking for a much more fine grained approach. So these initial works, which actually were broadly successful and, and led to a lot of further work, we need to go considerably further beyond that uh, if we're going to get this to work. So when I speak of fine-grained um, uh, sort of action recognition, what I'm talking about is things that distinguishing between things which actually are, are quite similar. So, for example, uh, here, the example I've given here, um, you know, if we as humans saw somebody trying to eat their soup with a fork, we would probably intuitively pass them a spoon. That's an example of uh, a very coarse example of what you know might see in an operating theatre with uh, with staff there. But actually, from a computer vision point of view, there isn't a lot of difference in that visual image between somebody eating spoon uh, a soup with a spoon and somebody eating soup with the fork. So we're going to need something that can distinguish between very similar activities. And when we do that, we're going to be training networks, for example, we're going to be uh, classifying actions, we're going to be um, analysing our results. And we tend to do that actually by attributing uh, sort of verb noun descriptions. So it could, in this case, eat soup, could be eat sausage, or in our industrial context, it could be tight and screw sort of type thing. So we use that language of verb noun descriptions to actually as our classifications in a sense for the different actions. So when we do fine grain action recognition, what's important is both the, the instantaneous image that we, did, that we have, the individual frame of the video, but also the temporal information, how that frame changes. And what I've shown here on the, on the slide is uh, nine images from one of these cartoon uh, things where the crab it, walks. 
So when that's shown in a continuous sequence, the crab would appear to our eyes to be walking across. Uh, what we see on an individual frame basis is actually very similar. There's not a lot of difference between the nine different uh, uh, images there that make up the sequence. And it's only in the sequence do we get the sense of the crab actually moving. So it's this temporal information that can be very useful. The other, th other techniques that we can bring to bear are things like optical flow. So optical flow is a concept which essentially looks at the uh, the differences between an image. We take one frame, we take another frame, and for example, in, in some basic level, we simply subtract one from the other and we look at the differences between the two frames. There are more sophisticated forms of optical flow, but the essential difference, the essential point really is that we can capture temporal information by just looking at the differences between one frame and another in the video sequence. So we can use some of these ideas to help us actually when we come to, to make the action recognition. So I'm going to now talk a little bit about our actual experiments and uh, our results. So uh, this work is actually in collaboration with a, a manufacturing company, Tharsis, that is um, uh, quite close to the university, just north of the university. And they actually build robots as it happens. But in their own factory, they've, uh, they're building these robots with a mixture of automated and manual assembly. So what happens is that workers uh, stand at benches and they assemble complicated sections of, of the robots uh, from components supplied to their workstation. So what we've done is we filmed the workers, and I'll show you some examples in a second, um, using a, a special kind of camera, it's called an Intel RealSense camera. And this not only takes an RGB image, but also takes a depth image. It contains a kind of LiDAR scanning device. Uh, at the same time. So you get a combination of normal images, but also the depth image, and we can use that information as well. Now, the great thing about look, working in this field actually is that it's quite easy to acquire large amounts of film because the workers are there, you know, six days a week or five days a week working at their benches, and we were able to generate quite large uh, data sets. So we filmed um, nearly 200,000 frames, uh, thousands of actions which we grouped together into sort of 26 fundamental action classes these are th things like tighten screw uh, you know insert part those kind of verb noun uh, classifications and then we used convolutional neural networks just as paul did uh, to train uh, networks that um, to recognize these actions and i'll show you some of the uh, the results. And then, of course, once we've trained those, we can validate those against another data set to measure their accuracy. So just to give you an idea, this is some GIFs of the films that we, the kind of films that we would take. So uh, this is, um, there are six here shown on the screen. Um, the top one on the top left uh, is, um, is simply uh, somebody unpacking a part. Then we've got other examples where they're tightening screws, tightening bolts, uh, attaching nuts and so on and so forth. So what we end up with is a large number of these films, uh, all taken with the same backdrop. It's, a, it's the, in, in this case, it's the same person. Um, the, the bench is, remains the same throughout all of the, uh, the show. Um, so our what we're trying to do is, is distinguish between quite similar actions on an identical backdrop. So that's quite a challenging uh, requirement uh, for the thing. Now, if I just focus on these two uh, examples, um, so these are two of the same examples, and the left-hand one is, is the worker is tightening a screw, the right-hand worker is he's tightening a nut. So in the left one is using a screwdriver, and in the right one, it's um, a, uh, a spanner. But if I stop it at the, about the right point there, Actually, visually, those images are very similar. The, the tool is in the same position. It would be very hard to know, really, whether one of them is using a screwdriver and one of them is using a spanner from that single, single image. And it's only in the temporal nature of it, when you see the tool turn on the spanner and the screwdriver turn, that we as humans would probably very quickly work out that one of them is using a spanner and one of them is using a, a screwdriver. So again, it just reinforces really the importance of the temporal information in determining actions 
uh, as opposed to a simple frame image where we might identify the objects there, but perhaps not the action. Just as a quick aside, this is the sort of information that we get from the Intel RealSense cameras. This is the, what you basically get is a, is a number of images from the, the same camera. Um, it records the normal image, but we also get depth images as well. And we can use that uh, as an additional source of information uh, is, is into the CNN networks. So I'd like to talk a little bit more in a bit more detail about the actual how we actually do the action recognition in, in terms of using this technology, this fantastic technology of convolutional neural networks. So it's now very standard if we want to recognize an object in a still image, we would use a 2D uh, convolutional neural network type approach, single images or groups of images, uh, just as Paul uh, alluded to in his talk uh, earlier. So if we wanted to extend that into the temporal domain, we could use what you might call a, a 3D uh, uh, CNN. We could train a more complicated multidimensional network on the, the full frame sequence that we see in the video. And this is referred to as a 3D CNN type approach. Now, that's actually quite um, uh, punishing on computu computational resources but actually it can be done. You can do that on high-end computers uh, on relatively short video sequences. Uh, and of course, as computers become more powerful, that will become uh, easier and easier as the years go by. However, for us at the moment, that's not really a solution for us because we want to be in, in um, uh, to doing action recognition at many places inside the factory, not just a single place. And we want to do it in real time in the factory um, so we need to be able to do it with more modest computing type things. So we've been ex we've been actually using uh, single board optimized devices like NVIDIA Jetsons, for example, which are um, much more designed for this kind of calculation, but are still available at quite reasonable price. And we've been essentially using a hybrid approach. So rather than doing a full temporal simulation on a full video sequence, what we do is we use a hybrid approach. Um, and this has actually uh, been, wasn't pioneered by us. We, we've just adopted the techniques developed by others. Um, but this approach has now become quite well established in action recognition. So what you do essentially is that you, you use the, a normal object recognition on a single images, and then you, you do that on multiple images, and then you have a temp, what's called a temporal aggregation step. Um, and the temporal step uses a relatively sparse selection. So you're not doing it on every frame and that reduces the computational uh, resources needed. So I'll just talk you through a little bit in more detail how that works. So what we do is we, this is really the workflow really that we follow um, uh, to use the same terminology as Paul. So we divide the video into segments of a few frames, might be a handful of frames. And within each uh, segment, we select one of the images. Now, it, within a segment, the image doesn't change very much. So we just select one of them. And we use that uh, to feed into a conventional convolutional neural network uh, type approach. Then we can manipulate some of these images within the segment. Maybe we'll use optical flow, for example, to calculate optical flow uh, differences. We use those manipulated images um, as the input into another CNN. And that's in a sense, a parallel stream, which represents the temporal information. We can also uh, do other tricks, which I'll, I'll allude to a little bit later to improve that temporal stream that runs alongside the, the conventional CNN. We repeat that for every segment, and then we can combine all the, the conventional CNNs and form a consensus then about uh, through a consensus function. We can do the same with the temporal flow, and then we can put that together, uh, the, the both flows to form our action recognition. So we end up with a multi-stage process that is essentially uh, has parallel streams and brings together at the end, a full understanding of both the, the actual image, but also the temporal flow, which is what helps us to determine the actions. So our, our, as I said, our, we have a very able uh, student working on this, Matthew. He, he used the PyTorch uh, framework with this. We use a conventional um, CNN as the backbone. We, he used ResNet 50. 
Um, and we, uh, we crop the images and we apply an anti-jitter procedure as well, because actually that's the other thing in video film is that you often have jitter as well as, uh, um, uh, you know, as focus issues as well. So then we also do, um, to strengthen the temporal throw, we, we actually also move some frames back and forward in the temporal flow so that segments having access to information from the segment before and the segment after. So that strengthens the sense of temporal flow through the temporal in that temporal stream. And then we can optimize aspects such as the time step. When we divide it into segments, what, um, how, what's the length of that segment? It, that's actually turns out to be quite an important thing. If it's too short, then there's not enough temporal flow information in that segment. If it's too long, then the computer can't do the number crunching. So we have to optimize that. But actually we achieved a good degree of accuracy, very high degree of accuracy on many of the, uh, uh, the tasks. Um, so we were able to actually quite accurately identify, for example, the, the, the film that I showed you, we were very able to identify the differences between those. We still struggle on some of the actions that the workers undertook, but by and large, we have very quite successful identification of the actions. So that begins really to move us towards this idea of the robot helper. So the next steps for us really are, um, are actually to now in integrate this approach with uh, a robot actually. So the robot that we've chosen is this one I've shown in the picture here. It's made by a company called ABB. Uh, it's a so-called Yumi robot. It's a, one of the most advanced uh, collaborative robots that's available. What we're going to do is then use this action recognition and couple it with um, a, a, a system that will, in a, in a sense, have a, an understanding of what the task is to be completed. We actually, uh, this is based on a very well-known large body of work, knowledge representation and reasoning, reasoning uh, body of work really, which is a very large and well-developed well uh, research community. And then we will combine that with accurate kinematic positioning of the robot so that the actual robot can actually interleave its actions with the persons. So it may be able to actually work directly uh, and it's getting hopefully get us some way towards the integrated working that we see uh, in both in the operating theatre. And just this also is useful for quality control in the factory because we can tell whether the right task has gone. I'm conscious I'm running out of time. So I'm just gonna put up my thank you slide uh, and stop there. So thanks, these are all the people I'd like to thank who've helped us with the work. Fantastic, Nick. Sorry to cut you short there. I know, I could say, <laughs> yeah, it's always a problem, isn't it? We do have a question in Slido for you. Um, how much does your consensus between frames tend to vary? Have you looked at using this variation as an indication of uncertainty, i.e similar to a, hang on, it's just run out of the chat, similar to a deep ensemble. Yeah, so the, um, the consensus function is, um, is a key part of it really, obviously, and um, it, it, we're exploring actually the variability of that at the moment, actually. So it, I, I think it depends on the action. Some actions have got very clear motions, for example. So the, the turning of the spanner example, for example, you've got a very clear rotational motion there which actually the system uh, can latch onto quite well and so that can you you know you get a very tight answer out of such a circumstance what it really struggles with is actions that are very similar like um we have a terrible it, it's really struggling with there's some things where the workers for example will have to lift a bolt and put a bolt on top of a screw it really struggles with that kind of thing. There isn't really a lot of visual information. It just looks like a hand being moved across the field of view. And it's ver very difficult for the system to distinguish that um, from many other similar actions. So in those cases, we, the consensus functions really struggle actually in that. And we haven't really solved that problem really, I don't think as yet. But, but uh, going back to the other point is that yes, it, it, the, um, it does give you information about the um, uncertainty as well, I think, but again, we don't, I think we, um, we have to develop a bit more understanding about that to know whether, how useful that will be. That's a really interesting insight. And I'm imagining all kinds of other, you know, um, situations where similar sorts of processes and uh, yeah. are, are gonna be really useful as well, even outside of manufacturing, but maybe that's for another conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you um, both. Thank you, um, Nick Wright and Paul Wilcox and all the teams that, that you're working with uh, for your talks today. Um, it's been great to welcome you to the JGI, to the University of Bristol and to support the work of the Alan Turing Institute. Thank you also to everyone in the background that have made today possible. Um, Patty Holly, our University Liaison Manager, um, Lily Rice, our Coordinator, um, and, and all the other people involved in putting on these events. If you've enjoyed this and you'd like more, please do look at the Turing website where you'll see lots of other um, presentations and talks and stuff available to you. Um, and we thank you for coming today. Friday, Friday morning, but loads of you here, really great response. Nice round of applause for our speakers and have a great day. Bye now. <laughs>